I need not Nor man's empty praise Be thou mine inheritance Now and always Be thou and the only The first in my heart O sovereign of heaven My Suddenly articulate With a thousand songs to lift one cry Then from north to south And east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified
Heavenly Father, we just thank you that uh, we can be here this morning. Lord, we just ask that you'll speak to each one of us. We pray that you'll speak through Pete, uh, that you'll just fill him with your words, that you can speak direct to us through Pete. And Father, we just thank you that it doesn't matter how small we feel or how insignificant, we just thank you that you can use us and we pray that you'll just show us what you want us to do. In Jesus' name, Amen. Yeah, so as Paul says, we're starting a new series of the little people, and today we're going to read from John 5, John 6, verses 1 to 15. John 6, 1 to 15. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is the boy. Uh, Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of barley loaves left over uh, by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself to pray <clears throat> there was just something else I wanted to say before we look at that uh, I just wanted to thank Monica and Charlotte and Paul although he made part of the mess for, <laughs> for clearing up the church after the building work here they did it can we just give them a round of applause because <clears throat> let me tell you that especially the annex was thick with dust and out here it was all over the church and they've cleared it all up and made it nice for us today to come and worship so thank you very much to them now I wonder if you've ever had a day that's turned out differently to how you thought it was going to perhaps in a good way hopefully in a good way that you perhaps were going to something and you knew it was going to be good but it was just so amazing much more than you expected or were thought it would be And that's sort of our story today with this young lad. I'm sure he knew it was going to be a special day because he was going to go and meet Jesus, he was going to hear Jesus, he was going to go and watch him uh, heal the sick and and teach amazing things. So he knew it was going to be a good day, I'm sure, when he set out uh, on that journey to, to go and find Jesus and hear him speak. But what a day it was for him. He had a an experience that he would never forget. That Jesus would take the mere picnic that he had, the, the five barley loaves, which is a, a very basic loaf in those days of the poor, and two fish, which was very much a food around the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus would take those very basic food things and turn them into feeding this 5,000 men plus uh, who would come to hear Jesus. Who knew, as he set out that day, that his little lunch would be the blessing of so many people? And what a tale he'd have to tell when he went home and said, No, Mum, that lunch you made me, do you know it fed 5,000 plus people? And his mum would have said, No! And then he would have sort of told her the story. And he would have had that story, you know, what a great story to tell around the table as he grew up and had friends around. And he said, Do you know what happened to me once? You know, it was amazing, wasn't it? It was like the ultimate bring and share, wasn't it? You know, sometimes we we bring our food stuff to bring and share, uh, and we look at it and we think, hmm, 
Don't you know if we've got enough here? And then everybody has enough, don't they? Uh, but this is the ultimate bring and share. You bring one little lunch for 5,000 people and everybody goes home filled up uh, and there's plenty left over. So remember that next week when we come for picnic here. Um, uh, so maybe one of us should just bring a bit of lunch and we'll get one of the elders, Paul or Martin, to pray over it and s see what happens. Uh, but anyway, uh, maybe our faith is not that big right now. But let's have a quick summary of where we are with this story. Uh, the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle that is recorded in all four Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And therefore, there seems to be that there's some real emphasis in this miracle. It really touched people's hearts. It was an amazing thing that people saw and experienced. And obviously, the writers of the Gospel, uh, it really touched them and, and, and they find it uh, uh, worth writing down and they all give a slightly different account of what they saw what they experienced or what they heard people say about it so that we get a full picture of what happened that day uh, and uh, mark tells it that his disciples had just returned uh, from a mission trip jesus had sent them out on their first mission trip the 12 disciples he'd taught them how to go out a bit like steve does to teach people to go out and preach the gospel uh, and uh, he sent them out, and they did amazing miracles. They healed the sick. They preached the word of the kingdom of God, and people came uh, and started to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the one sent by God. Uh, and it was an amazing experience for them. And they came back and they told Jesus about all that had happened and the amazing experiences that they'd had speaking about Jesus to the towns around that way. And Jesus, knowing that they'd been on this trip and that they were probably very tired, and Jesus was probably quite tired himself, he thought he would go off to a lonely place, a, a solitude place, place of solitude, uh, and there rest for a while and perhaps pray and just have some fellowship together as the disciples and him. But as was the one, everywhere Jesus went, the crowds followed. And as he sort of made his way across Galilee, word got out like the bush telegraph around Galilee. Jesus is going over there. He's going to Bethesda. Uh, let's go. Let's go and see what he's doing. And all the crowds started to gather again. So they had no peace. They didn't have that time of rest. They didn't have that time of fellowship or prayer together because the crowds started to gather. And although they were exhausted, and hungry, it says Jesus continued to heal the sick and minister to the people. And I, I just think, isn't that a, a wonderful picture of the untiring saviour that we have? The God who never sleeps. The God who is always there. As the psalm says, when we wake in the morning, you are still there. Jesus never tired of doing good and preaching the word of God and healing the sick and helping those in need. And although they were exhausted, Jesus continued to minister to the people. And that's how he is with us today, isn't it? He never tires to do what is the right thing for us. When we're in a pickle, when we get into problems, he is there. When things are going well, he is there. When life is jogging along, he is there. His presence is always with us. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. And the disciples, as the day went on, as we read in this uh, account and in the other accounts, as the day went on, uh, they started to get a bit worried that these people hadn't eaten. Now, it, it puzzles me why only one boy brought a picnic to, the, to that. I, I'm not really sure. Maybe Paul's got the answer to that. He usually tells me at the end. But there, there was all these people. Maybe they had brought their picnics and hadn't realised the day would go on for so long and they'd run out of food. And, and the disciples were getting uh, concerned that the people would be hungry if they didn't go and find something, if they didn't go to their homes or find some lodging and find something to eat. So uh, they, they told Jesus about this and said, you know, we ought to dismiss the people, let them go. And this is another lovely thing I love about Jesus. He said, well, you know, it was almost as if the disciples said, well, it's not our responsibility to feed these people, so let's let them go, let them find their own food. Uh, Jesus had the opposite thought, didn't he? He said, well, why don't we feed them? And isn't that the lovely thing about Jesus? He always goes that extra mile, does that extra thing, and that's what he wants us to do as well in our ministry as Christians. Our powerful ministry that we have is always going that extra mile, doing that extra thing, doing the thing that, the, that other people wouldn't have thought of doing 
but through the love of Jesus, we want to do for other people. That's a really powerful witness. When you do that at work or to your neighbours, to your family, if you do that extra thing, it really uh, talks to people. Why, why would you do that? Why, why would you bother so much about my needs, what I need? And it speaks to people about the love of Jesus. And Jesus said, well, well, let's feed them then. You know, where can we get bread? Where can we get bread? They say there's no such thing as a silly question. Have you ever been, um, have you ever been to a conference or a course that you've been on and, and the instructor says there's no such thing as a silly question? You know, if you feel you want to ask something, ask something. Well, this does seem like a silly question, doesn't it? But it tells us in the word that Jesus already knew the answer to the question. He was testing his disciples. Where can we get food at this time of day? Where can we get food to feed all these people? And Philip says, Lord, that's, that's a silly thing to say. There's nowhere we can get food this time of day. And if we had enough money, uh, you know, it wouldn't buy uh, enough food for all these people to have a bite each. Uh, and uh, it, it just reminded me that sometimes we think on that human level, don't we, when we're doing the work of God. Uh, we try and find the answer in our weakness and in our human way of thinking of things. We must remember that God has higher plans, higher ways than our ways. Uh, and uh, as they were thinking about this, they were trying to think of it uh, as, as a human. You know, how can we feed these people? Where, where would be open? What baker would be able to bake enough bread for all these people? If we're, where are we going to get the money? You know, all these questions that are on a human level. And it surprises me because they've just been on this mission trip. They've just been healing the sick. They've been preaching the kingdom of God. They've seen powerful things happen and they could see how Jesus' name does powerful things. And then when Jesus asks them a question, they've got the answer right in front of them. Jesus. And they think, well, where can we get bread this time of day? All they had to do was say to Jesus, what can you do about this situation? How can you come into this situation and provide food for all these people? So sometimes we just need to remember to think outside of that box that we're sometimes trapped in of thinking, what can we do? And instead say, what can God do? How can God work in this situation and hand the problem over to him? We're in good company if we think like that, because the Bible is full of characters who try to do things in their own strength and then found out in the long run that it's God who does the doing and we just have to be the willing people to carry out his work. So the disciples... Uh, uh, try and work out this conundrum uh, and and Andrew almost in a throwaway comment says well you know there's one boy here but he, he's got five loaves and, and two fish you know almost, it was almost like a joke you know how, how can you know it's silly isn't it this is all we've got and they've got all these people so Jesus said bring them here bring it here bring it here and this is where we want to just very quickly uh, with three very quick points, just concentrate on this lad because we're thinking about the impact that this lad had through Jesus in his lunch that he brought. And who knew, as he set out that day, that his lunch was going to feed all these people. So what can we learn from him uh, and, and his lunch that he brought? Well, I think the first thing is that when we set out to find Jesus and offer what we might think is very little to God, you will be blessed. God will bless what you bring to him. It says uh, in Isaiah 55, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk. Without money, without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labour on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me. Eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fear. When you bring your little to God, when you commit yourself to God, you will have untold blessing in your life. I'm not saying you're going to be a millionaire, uh, but you will have untold blessings in Jesus Christ in so many other ways. The return to you when you offer to Christ will be so much more than you could ever think or imagine. This boy... He brought his lunch. Uh, I don't know how 
big the loaves were or the fish. I don't know whether that was meant to last him all day, whether it was a fair meal for him to have that day. But he would have eaten more after Christ blessed that bread and fish. And everybody would have ate more than they could have imagined or what that middle meal was than that little meal that he brought. In Philippians 4, it says, The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In other words, don't be like the disciples and think, you know, how, how am I going to get around this? What am I going to do? How, how are we going to make this little lunch? How, where are we going to get bread from? Just commit it to God. Hand it over to him and see what he can do. Just let him bring peace to your mind. Let his peace uh, come into your mind and guide your hearts that transcends all understanding when we're facing those sort of problems. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be given unto you. Untold blessing comes from God when we commit ourselves to him. When we say to God, you are able. Because in effect, when... We look at the lunch and we say, well, this is not enough. You know, how can, we, how can we feed all these people? Where can we get food from? We're saying to God, well, you're not able to, to, to deal with this. You're not big enough. And that's one of the biggest insults we could ever give to God. We need to hand that lunch. We need to offer what we have to God and say, Lord, it's not very much. But you make of it what you will. And see what he does in your life. Never say, I've got nothing to give. Never say, what I have to give is so small it won't matter. Just give it to God and see what God can do uh, through what you're prepared to give to him. The second thing is that when we uh, set out to find Jesus, as this little boy did, and offer what we have, we will be a blessing to others. This boy was a blessing to 5,000 plus people on this day. He had no idea that that was going to happen. But his forethought, or or maybe his mum packing up a lunch, her forethought blessed 5,000 people that day on that hillside. The gifts, the time, possessions the Lord has given you, however small and insignificant you may think they are, when offered to God will be used for the blessing of the whole of his people. Jesus doesn't want us to be like most of the crowd who followed Jesus just because they wanted to see these miracles like some magic show. They didn't He doesn't want people who just come for what they can take out of what they uh, can see or or done in church. He wants people who are prepared to give so that they may receive blessing, but that you also may be a blessing to others. This lad came and willingly gave his lunch to Jesus. He probably thought, well, what's Jesus going to do with this, you know? (laughs) How is he going to make this feed? And then he saw an amazing thing happen in front of his eyes. And he was a blessing through the name of Jesus to all those people. If you think you haven't got much to offer and therefore do not share with God's people, you miss out on that blessing yourself, but so do we. We all miss out if you don't give what you have, your gifts, your time, your possessions to God. Not only you miss out, but we miss out on what God can do through you for all of us too. It says in Corinthians 1 verse 12 that we're like a body. And it talks about that body, isn't it? It has many parts. And the, and, and the hand can't say to the foot, you know, I'm not part of the body because it all functions together. The, the body is an, is an amazing thing. It's a mind-blowing piece of creation that God has created, as every living thing is. It's incredible how it all works together. Uh, and if there is a part of that body that is hurting, say you've got a, even a sore toe, the whole body suffers, doesn't it? And so it is in the church, if we're like a body. If you don't function as God wants you to function, if you don't give what you have, your gifts, your time, your possession, to be honoured by him, we all suffer. Because we all have to give what we have for the blessing of God and the blessing of of one another. And lastly, as we finish, the little you bring will be multiplied by God. Your little can be big in God's hands. 
Never withhold what little you have because you think it's too insignificant to offer to God. The Bible is littered with examples of how God used the weak, the insignificant, the unimportant, the worthless to do great things in his name. We could go through a whole long list, and I think I have read a list before now, of all the people in the Bible that seem so unfit, so worthless to do the work of God, and yet God used them in mighty ways. Some of them said, Lord, you know, I'm the youngest. I'm the least in my family. Lord, I haven't got anything that I can, you know, I can't speak properly. And others made all sorts of excuses. They didn't think they had anything to offer to God. And God said, just give it to me. Give me, give me your willingness. Give me your availability. And see what I can do through your life. And that is what God is calling us to this morning. And Paul uh, had a hymn in the first service uh, about whom shall I send? And it says, here I am, Lord. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. He's not asking that you give him very much at all. Perhaps we've got nothing. In fact, there's nothing of worth in our life that we can give to God. But he wants our life. He wants our heart. He wants our belief. He wants our trust in him. And when we give that to him, he can do amazing things through you, however little you may feel, how insignificant you may feel, however worthless you may feel. See what God can do through your life when you give him the little that you have. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us the wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, redemption. Therefore it is written, let one who boasts boast in the Lord so as we go out this morning just carry those three things with you from this story when you offer yourself to God however worthless you may think you are or what you have is you will be blessed abundantly far beyond the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want for anything when you offer yourself to God you will be a blessing to him and to others. And when you offer yourself to God, he can take the little you have and multiply it in such a way that you could never imagine for his blessing, for his kingdom. So I hope that's a, a few little lessons that we've learned from that story this morning. Thanks. How great is our God